today what I want to do is tell everybody a little bit about the the riparian raptor community in the Trans Pecos in particular. Just kind of an overview of what species make up that community and how they kind of coexist in those areas and the importance of those areas for them. Uh, then I'm going to give some details on a study that a, a graduate student of mine and I worked on looking at uh, nesting habitat partitioning and distribution of uh, some of those key species. And then I'm going to uh, to dig into some of the more recent work that I've been doing, uh, looking at zone tailed hawks in particular and uh, their uh, seasonal home ranges and movement patterns and some other things. Okay. So the, the Trans Pecos region includes all or part of 15 counties Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, it's the most expansive of all the ecoregions of Texas. It covers uh, 22 million acres and it has an elevational range from 2,000 to over 8. It is the southernmost and the second largest desert in North America. Sorry about that. And so one of the things about it is it is a, a, a true desert and aridity is a major constraint on vegetation growth in this region. Uh, and just water is a limited resource in general. Uh, the desert grasslands are the most widespread vegetation type. And they occur across most of the landscape. Uh, desert shrubs occupy those lower elevations also. And then there's open woodlands at the higher elevations in the mountain ranges. Uh, and then in the corridors down in the bottoms. And the precipitation is really low 20 to 50 centimeters. And uh, I was surprised by this. Uh, the Chihuahuan Desert is considered one of the three most biologically diverse arid regions on Earth. Uh, I thought the Sonoran Desert was a uh, higher rank than the Chihuahuan, but uh, who knew? So our Chihuahuan Desert is on par with the Great Sandy Desert of Australia and the Namib Karoo in Southern Africa. So within these areas, the riparian zones are those areas with either permanent or ephemeral surface water. These are really kind of widely considered as arteries within these desert systems. It's estimated they contain up to half of the avifauna. And here in the Trans Pecos, they contain multiple federal and state threatened bird species. And within this, there's a this unique raptor community within these areas. And and here's some examples of riparian areas. Uh, on the left, you see this is in Mexico. The one in the middle, I'm, I can't recall which riparian area that is, but that's where it's got some surface water flowing. Uh, and then the, on the lower right is the uh, uh, the headwater, the uh, grotto at the north end of Mexicano Falls. So, getting into some of the raptors that occur in this area, uh, we you, we have both resident birds, and then we have the seasonal migrants. And uh, the first resident bird, the, the only resident exhibitor is the Cooper's hawk. And these guys are common in the riparian areas, but also up in the upper woodlands, Davis Mountains and the Chisos. And these guys are primarily bird hunters. Uh, they're also common throughout Texas in a lot of uh, the hill country around the big cities. Uh, they're a common urban bird these days. Uh, a common summer breeding bird in this area is the Swainson's hawk. And they will nest uh, occasionally in the riparian areas, but also in uh, trees, single trees out on the open uh, grasslands and shrubland slopes and the bajadas and everything. And these guys are, uh, they winter down in the Argentina, come up here in the summer and breed throughout Western North America. And they primarily hunt small mammals and reptiles and a surprisingly large proportion of their diet is made up of invertebrates. Red-tailed hawks are a year-round resident. I'm sure everybody on here is familiar with red-tailed hawks. Uh, they will nest pretty much anywhere they can find a suitable nest site. That includes riparian areas, uh, single trees in the open desert uplands, 
and even all the way up to the, the mountaintops in the, the Trans-Pecos. They'll nest in trees and they'll nest on cliffs as well. And they will eat pretty much anything they can catch that's of suitable size. They eat a lot of snakes, a lot of small rodents. Occasionally they will get birds. And then another uh, uh, relatively common bird is the American kestrel. Now, these guys are widespread across North America. They, some of the, the maps you may see for uh, American kestrels in Texas show them as not occurring in the Trans-Pecos, when in actuality they do occur there. Uh, I have several nests that I monitor there. Uh, they're uncommon as a breeder, but they are found there, uh, and they, uh, the numbers increase during the winter. These guys are generally restricted to either riparian areas for nesting and like some of the big old cottonwoods. They're, they're a cavity nester, and so they need something that has cavities. But I've also found them at upper elevation areas where you have a, a large tree that may have some old cavities in it from woodpeckers and also in uh, telephone poles. Getting into uh, some of the nocturnal birds, the uh, screech owls, both eastern and western screech owls occur in the Trans-Pecos. Uh, they are regular occupants in the riparian areas, but they also occupy those upper elevation oak woodlands and even up in the pine woodlands. And uh, again, they just, they're kind of restricted by having areas with trees that are large enough to have adequate cavities for them to nest in. They too are a cavity nester. Uh, the big dog in the mix, uh, great horned owls. They're a year round resident. Uh, you find them regularly in the riparian areas. Uh, usually they're, they're so secretive, you almost have to flush them out before you can spot them because they blend in so well with everything. Uh, but they're found pretty much everywhere. Uh, everything for the riparian areas all the way up to the highest elevations. They'll nest in trees, they'll nest on, uh, they, they don't build their own nests. They'll nest on the, the old nests from ravens and other raptors, uh, but also on cliff scrapes. Uh, in abandoned buildings, uh, so uh, pretty much anything that is big enough for them that has a, a, a level surface and is somewhat protected from the elements. And uh, I make kind of a joke here that they eat anything that don't eat them first, and and that kind of sounds facetious, but it's actually pretty much true. I've I found in horned owl pellets everything from rattlesnake skulls to uh, porcupine quills. Uh, how they survive that, I have no idea, uh, but they uh, will eat things up to about the size of a, a skunk, uh, jackrabbits, and then everything down to, uh, you know, centipedes and grasshoppers. Okay, getting into the specialties for the riparian areas, and this is this is kind of getting into the group that I really want to focus on today. Uh, the first one is the elf owl, and these are the tiniest owl in the world. Uh, they could easily fit a couple of them in a coffee cup. That's how small they are. They are a cavity nester, uh, they are only here during the breeding season in the Trans-Pecos. They also get somewhat over into the hill country areas of Texas. Uh, in uh, the, right, the Trans-Pecos, they're often found in the cottonwood riparian areas, but also in the lower elevation oak woodlands. Um, I don't know if they go much higher than those, those lower and mid-ranges of the oak woodlands. I haven't found them higher than that. Uh, Again, they, they require uh, trees and telephone poles large enough to have cavities in. Pretty much uh, a diurnal equivalent of a kestrel in terms of the size of a cavity they need. And these guys prey almost exclusively on invertebrates. They are uh, also very popular with uh, ecotourism birding. Uh, they're very charming little owls. They have a distinct call. And so in places like Davis Mountain Park and other places, uh, they're a sought after bird for a uh, bird list. One of the one of the big specialties in the Trans-Pecos is the gray hawk. Now this is a state threatened species, not federally, but state threatened. Uh, they are found uh, in Texas. They're uh, seasonal uh, summer only in the Trans-Pecos, but they're found year round down in the lower Rio Grande Valley, down around McAllen and Brownsville. These guys, Typically, wherever they're at, they typically nest in riparian woodlands, but they forage outside of those woodlands in adjacent mesquite and brush uplands. They prey primarily on lizards, but they will occasionally get some other prey like uh, small mammals, wood rats and such, occasionally birds. Uh, and then I, I already talked about the distribution and presence. They are, they're pretty unique in that they're a booty hawk, 
but if you just saw the silhouette, you might think you were looking at a Cooper's hawk. They are very occipiter like uh, in their build, uh, but their plumage is completely different. As you can see here, it's uh, all gray on the back and then this uh, gray bar right through the breast. And this is another one that's a real popular one for the ecotourism and birders to, uh, to get for their bird lists. Another state threatened species, not federally, but state threatened is the common black hawk. And this is a big raptor. This is about the size of a red-tailed hawk. It's black overall, and I'm, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on the black hawk because it's very similar to the next one that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the black hawk is overall black. It's got these really long secondary feathers in the wings, which make the wings look really broad. Um, that's that's because those secondaries are so long. Uh, and that also makes the tail appear short because those uh, secondary feathers of the wing are so long. Uh, the tail, and this is a distinctive diagnostic for the black hawk, is it's got that single broad white band right in the middle of the tail. Now, with the birds in flight, like you can see in this graphic, uh, there's some rusty color in the primaries and secondaries. Sometimes they'll have a little bit of a white crescent area up near the carpal patch at, that's at the wrist of the wing. Uh, they're kind of blocky in build. And if you look at the face on this, uh, this graphic, you can see that the lores, that area right in front of the eye between this, the, the beak and the eye, you have the beak and you have the sear, which is that kind of yellowy waxy area where the nares is. Then you have that bare skin. And in black hawks, the lowers are almost always bare and a really bright yellow. They also have legs that are generally long and also very yellow. And then another diagnostic for this species is that the wing tips do not touch, do not come down to the tail tip. And so in this picture, you can see the wing tips at the very back of the bird fall, fall short of the, uh, of the tail tip. Okay. These guys, what's, what's really unique about black hawks is if you don't have a permanent surface water area, you're not gonna have black hawks nesting in the area. They are only fed areas with surface water. And that's because they prey primarily on fish and amphibians and aquatic insects. And the tropics sell a prey on crabs and crustaceans. Um, here in, uh, in uh, Texas and Arizona and New Mexico, where they occur in the United States, uh, they will also catch a lot of reptiles that come down to those water edges. And then they'll catch some other things occasionally, but really they focus on amphibians and fish. And so we may, I, I've found situations here in the Trans-Pecos where you have a pair starting to nest in the spring, but we don't get the monsoonal rains, the surface water dries up, and they abandon their nesting attempt. They just can't make it if they don't have surface water. That's some more the black hawks. Uh, you can see that real bare lures, the broad white band in the tail. Okay. And then on the on the right there is a juvenile bird, which uh, I'll just have in this slide for comparison. They look quite different. Okay, so the species I wanted to compare this with is the zone tail hawk. Excuse me. So the zone-tailed hawk, similar to the black hawk, is it's black overall with some gray barring on the undersides of the remages or the, the flight feathers, the primaries and secondaries. And it has multiple white bands in the tail. About two thirds of the way down, it'll have a broader band. And then above that, it will have two to four narrow, narrower inner bands. Also in comparison to the black hawk in this picture, Look at how the wings are much narrower from front to back and the tail looks much longer on the zone tail. Okay. Zone tails are a leaner build than a black hawk. Uh, they strike me very much, for those of you that are familiar with Swainson's hawks, they are built very much like a Swainson's hawk in silhouette. Uh, in contrast to a black hawk, their lowers are grayish and they have more feathering in them. Uh, and their wing tips, as you can see in this picture, the wing tips do reach down to the, the tail tip. Zone-tailed hawks are, are interesting. They, uh, I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a bit later here, but they, uh, 
most of what we know about them is more anecdotal than actual research driven. They're one of the least studied raptors uh, that occur in the United States. We know that they forage over open country. They nest in riparian woodlands, but they'll also nest in ponderosa pine forests at high elevation. They prey on mammals, birds, and reptiles. Uh, their distribution in Texas is the Trans-Pecos and the Edwards Plateau. Uh, but I've recently gotten, uh, well, I know of nests now all the way over by Austin and San Antonio, and I have reports of one up near the Fort Worth area. Uh, so they're they're out there, but they're very they're highly distributed, but very diffuse in where they're found. So take a look at this. This is a thing that has been big in the ornithological circles, and there's been some debate over this. Uh, there's this idea that zone-tailed hawks are mimics of turkey vultures, and in this bottom left image, you can see the the zone-tail flying next to a turkey vulture, and in the the right, you see another picture of that, and you can see where they do have a similar appearance. Uh, I'm not going to argument over whether or not they're creepy or not. I think that there's a lot of, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of rationale for why it is mimicry. I think there's a lot of uh, reasonable arguments why it's just convergent evolution. Um, but that is, uh, uh, that's for another day and another topic. Uh, I did, I don't think anybody can respond to me here. Uh, typically, I have people uh, uh, answer, but I want you to take a look at this and uh, figure out for yourself which one's the black hawk and which one's the zone-tailed hawk, okay? And then we'll go to the next one. Well, first off, on the left is the zone-tail, on the right is the black hawk. What about here? On the left, long yellow legs, real yellow lowers. That's our black hawk. On the right, wingtips coming all the way down to the tail tip. That's a zone tailed hawk. You've already seen a couple of these pictures. Black hawk on the left, zone tail on the right. Uh, that's a black hawk on a nest. So, somebody in the chat, I want you to enter in the chat what's wrong with this picture. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to look at it, and then I'm going to go on. But uh, go ahead and take a look at it and see if you can figure out what's wrong with that picture. Okay. So now I'm going to get into some of the research uh, that we've been been doing. And if anybody has any questions about what I said so far, please put it in the chat, and we can come back to that. So back in 2018, I had a graduate student working with me, and. Uh, one of the research questions was looking at the distribution and nest habitat uh, use by riparian raptors in the Trans-Pecos and, and how we get these raptor communities uh, coexisting in these areas. And so this is the three counties we looked at, uh, Jeff Davis, Presidio, and Brewster counties. Uh, again, this is about, uh, I can't remember what the actual spatial extent is, but it's a very large area. Uh, down here at the bottom, you see Big Bend National Park and Big Bend Ranch State Park. And those blue stringers you see in there are the riparian areas that occur in the area. And we did not have access to all of them by any stretch of the imagination. We were very restricted to uh, areas we could search. Um, but we got about 30 linear kilometers surveyed on state, federal, and some private lands. And during these surveys, we basically did walking surveys along the riparian areas, looking for the hawks nesting in the trees. After, and I'm not gonna get into the, the monitoring for productivity, but after the nest uh, nesting season was over, we went in and we collected a lot of data at these nest sites. And uh, we paired nest sites with randomly paired sites within the groves. And we measured distance to main stem. So if you look at the nest tree, which is the column here on the left, we looked at the, the tree DBH, the tree height, the nest height, how low the canopy was. So we could look at the ratio of the canopy bottom to the canopy top. And then we looked at where the nest was placed in the tree as far as was it right along the main trunk of the tree or was it way out on the branches? And then we looked at nest sites. And that was within 11.4 meter radius 
around the nest. And in that we looked at percent ground cover, the height of all the trees, the DBHs of all the trees and the tree density within those plots. And one of the, the things that we're trying to look at is you have two different raptor species and how do they partition out nesting habitat when they're selecting a tree for it? And so some birds may nest really high up in the tree as you see here in the center, the, the tree in the middle. You know, whereas another bird may nest in smaller trees, but really way out on the edge of the, the canopy. And so that was one of the things we wanted to try to look at and see, are there some partitioning between these species and the types of trees, or can they all pretty much just nest in the same thing and there's something else they're selecting for or some other way that they are coexisting? And so if you're getting into some of the, the results here, uh, looking at nest site tolerances, so, so intraspecific nest distances, we found that 90.9% .9 of the nearest neighbors were interspecific. Uh, and that means that, you know, a black hawk nesting closer to a gray hawk than nesting closer to another black hawk. Uh, and so most of this was species putting up with other species, not with themselves. And that's the pattern we found. We found that within these riparian areas and the, the woodlands in these riparian areas were really small. Uh, in, in uh, even along Alameda Creek where we had access to areas uh, a lot of the woodlands, there were patchy groves of cottonwoods and some willows, some hackberry on occasion. And these were small woodlots. Uh, and we found an overall mean of 1.2 nests per hectare. That's that's per two and a half acres. So these birds are really packing themselves in to these small wooded areas. And in this graphic, you can see where this is one year where we had some of the different nest sites on these different riparian areas. And this does not include all the sites we had, but you can see in the, the insert where we had those three red ones are zone tailed hawks. But then if you look up to the, the right on that, you have a, a common black hawk, you have a zone tailed hawk and a gray hawk nesting really close to each other. And the, I mean, not a, a black hawk, a, a Cooper's hawk, and then Farther to the, the left, uh, right, you have a Cooper's hawk and a gray hawk nesting almost on top of each other. And so there's different ways that these birds may be able to coexist. It could be what they select for nest sites, what they prey on. But I think an important thing here is that there doesn't appear to be interspecific animosity to speak of. So it's not like a Cooper's hawk is trying to kill a gray hawk or a gray hawk's trying to kill a Cooper's hawk. They seem to have kind of a uh, truce. And maybe that's because nesting opportunities in these areas are so great, are, are so limited that they can only really persist by putting up with each other. Because if you fight with a, uh, with a, uh, a heterospecific, you're just gonna be constantly fighting all the time because another one's gonna come in. Uh, so that's just one of the ideas. Uh, but there's others that, you know, they're, they're because they partition prey, they're not eating the same things that they they tolerate each other or that they're using different nesting things. And so looking at the nest trees, uh, there's a little bit of differences in sample sizes here because we weren't able to collect all data on all nest sites, if that makes sense. Some, like um, one of the common black hawk nests, the tree was partially on, partially off private property where we did not have access. So we could get some measurements, but we could not get others as an example. So, but in a nutshell with these figures on the left, the green bars are height of the nest tree, the brown bars are height of the nest, and then the blue bars are the relative place that the nest is put within the tree. And, and what you can see here is that the zone-tailed hawks are choosing the tallest
Okay, one moment, folks, while we wait to figure out what's going on with the tech here, it looks like Dr. Bowles' connection may have dropped out. So just hang tight for a moment. We'll see if we can get this back up and running. So, Dr. Bull, can you hear me talking? We cannot hear what your, your sound is not coming through. And we've lost you there for about a couple minutes. To a greater extent than Cooper's uh, And I will come back to this briefly in a moment. So looking at what these birds are using compared to what's randomly available uh, within the groves where the nest occurs. Uh, in the, we have Cooper's hawks, gray hawks, and zone tails. We were not able to do this for black hawks because of limited accessibility for some of these measures. We look at tree height, tree DBH, and trees per hectare between the nest size and the areas. And what we found was there was really no difference in what Cooper's hawks, if you look at the, the column all the way on the right, that's our p-values, nothing for Cooper's hawks and hawks that really differentiated what they were using compared to what was randomly available. Um, the one thing that we saw a difference on was zone-tailed hawks. Even within what's randomly available, they are picking the biggest trees in terms of height and dbh and a lower density of trees per hectare which makes sense you're picking bigger trees you can only have so many trees within a unit area and the bigger they are the fewer you're going to have and so zone tailed hawks were significantly were selecting trees significantly larger in height and dbh than what was randomly available whereas the coops and gray hawks we're selecting pretty much what was randomly available for them out there. Okay, this is the, the one I wanted to come back to because it kind of puts things in perspective. And, and some of this is, is the benefit of having been out there and being able to kind of visually put some of this together. So imagine, if you will, this, this stream you have coming through from the right side across to the left. It's dry. And then you start getting some surface water and then you have surface water through a main section of grove and then it tapers off and goes back below ground. You may have a single tree up at that dry section, a large grove in the middle where you have a lot of water and then where the water tapers off, you might have another small grove. And typically what we found with these raptors is that the zone tails, they'll nest in a single tree, a single big tree or in these smaller trees. And then if you look at the graphic on the that big tree, they nest really high and way out on the periphery of the tree. Now, zone-tailed hawks forage out over open country. When they come into the nest, they're a long-winged hawk. They don't wanna have to struggle getting through the branches to the nest. They want easy entry and egress from their nest. And I think that's why they put the nest high in the tree and on the periphery where they can access it from outside that canopy, they can go straight to it. Okay. Cooper's hawks, gray hawks, and common black hawks will be in these denser groves. Cooper's common black hawks, where you only have surface water, and then the gray hawks and Cooper's hawks seem to get along pretty well within these areas. And you could also have a zone-tailed hawk in a bigger grove like this as well. But if you look at the graphic on the left, you can also see more visually where within a tree each of those species would be placing their nest. Cooper's or the common hawk was and right in the middle of the tree. Cooper's hawk high higher and a little bit away from the center, and a gray hawk higher up and out on the periphery. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Gray hawks also forage out over those open areas that mesquite uplands and such. And when they come in, 
they also want to enter the tree, the nest from outside that canopy. So having it closer to the canopy edge, especially on a smaller tree that doesn't have as large a canopy, they have that easy entry and egress. In contrast, Cooper's hawks hunt sub canopy. They're hunting along the riparian area for birds. And what they will do is cruise low and then just shoot straight up underneath the tree up to their nest. And so they'll put a nest right up in the center of the tree uh, and they kind of come up from underneath, not flying through the branches. But even if they need to fly through the branches, they're very adept at that because they're an exhibitor and that's what they're built for. Common blackhawks also forage down low on that water surface area, hunting frog, fish, and snakes. And so when they fly in, they don't really go out over the open area. They fly along the river area. Cooper's hawk will fly up low into the tree, but they don't want to have to struggle to get high up into the canopy like a Cooper's hawk can. And so I think that's why their nest is generally lower and down where and, and closer to the center of the tree where they have a large crotch in the tree that can hold a nest. Um, so we have some data to support this, and the observational data certainly supports this pattern with them. Uh, any questions on that too, uh, people can put in the chat and we'll come back to them. Right now, I wanna switch into uh, the project I currently have going on that I'm pretty excited about, uh, and it's focused on uh, zone tail hawks. So zone tailed hawks, as I've already mentioned, uh, they are a summer resident in the Trans-Pecos. You can see in the, the map graphic here uh, where they are alleged to pop up in, in Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. There have been more recent uh, sightings of them, even up in Colorado. Uh, they're getting over into uh, farther east in Texas. Uh, there's been some sightings in uh, Utah and Nevada, and even a couple over along the east coast. Uh, so those real outliers, not worried about that, but they do seem to be expanding their distribution somewhat in Texas and uh, New Mexico and Arizona. I mentioned earlier that they're one of the least studied raptors in North America, and, and this is true. I did a literature review for this species, and since 2000, there have been no, at least in, in the, the common ornithological and wildlife literature, there have been no scientific publications regarding the ecology of the species in the United States or Mexico. There have been some in Central and South America, South America, but those were more multiple species assessments of distribution. Uh, and, and even the data that are known, as, as you can see from the, the general themes here, that idea of vulture mimicry, uh, flight displays, some data on breeding biology, one of those actually from Texas back in the, the uh, mid eighties, uh, some work on diet, and then there's been a lot on species overlap. So they're really, just wasn't much known about zone-tailed hawks in terms of even distribution in Texas, uh, how big their home ranges were, uh, anything about them like that. And so, as I spoke earlier uh, about the uh, uh, Caroline Skidmore, my graduate student, her thesis work, uh, which I've already kind of covered, and then I started this project in 2021 with GPS transmitters to try to look at the habitat use, seasonal home ranges, and migration routes of zone-tailed hawks. And the idea on this for zone-tailed hawks is that this is a state-threatened species, but it's it's listed as state-threatened primarily because there's just a lack of, of quantitative data for it. Uh, it's, it's listed out of, you know, uh, caution for the conservation of this species uh, because we don't really have any information to inform conservation decisions. And so that's kind of where, what I'm trying to do with this project. So uh, again, this study area it was in Jeff Davis, Presidio and Brewster counties. I am going to be expanding this out uh, this coming summer. I hope to put a couple of GSMs on birds over in the Austin and San Antonio area. Uh, I've already talked about this a little bit, other than I think it's worth pointing out that uh, this region of Texas has one of the a very low human density. It's 0.5 people per kilometer square. It just shows you how open and vacant much of this land is. Uh, again, one of the things I didn't really mention earlier, 
is that these riparian areas, it, the, the landscape down there, for those of you that haven't been into the Trans-Pecos, it's really vast and much of it is really tough to access. Uh, for example, this picture at the top, um, that takes from the nearest paved road, that takes about six hours to get to. Uh, and that's, and and it takes a serious four wheel drive to get to either where I'm standing there or down to the other end of it where you have to get to walk all the way up at the survey. The picture at the bottom, uh, that takes a ways to, a while to get into, but then on top of from where you can stop, it takes about three hours to hike in there to survey this wooded. Well, not three hours, about two and a half hours to hike in there and survey this area. Uh, in the summer, when it's pushing triple digits and water sources are limited, that means you got to carry a lot of water with you. So it's just that it, it may not seem like we surveyed that many areas, but the reality is we surveyed quite a few. And we spent a lot of time getting between them to go in and survey them. Uh, these areas are very diffuse across the landscape. Uh, it is some beautiful landscape. I mean, right, Big Bend Ranch State Park is one of the is one of the unheralded gems in Texas, I think. But it takes some effort. Okay. So we I'm sorry. Uh, we went in and what we did is uh, got access to uh, some public lands and some private lands, and we captured uh, adult zone tailed hawks with doe gaza traps, which I'll show you here in a minute. We recorded all the morphometric measurements. We banded GS leg band, and then we cut fitted them with what you see on the back of this hawk is a GPS transmitter. Now, these transmitters are programmed to acquire nine fixes daily. And the way we trap them is a doe gaza net, which on the left you can see we're putting up these posts, these poles, and there's nets in between them. Uh, in the middle, I'm setting up this robotic great horned owl. We've also used robotic robotic zone-tailed hawks and live horned owls to trap them. I would then sit there close by in a ghillie suit, and uh, the picture on the right, you can see how that net's set up and one of the birds is flying over. So once we, uh, uh, for analysis with these birds, we use continuous time movement models. Uh, this is a, a bunch of uh, technical jargon as far as the models used and everything. But basically what we did is we, we looked at related kernel density estimators to look at home range sizes. Uh, and we calculated the 95% home range sizes. And then for migration paths, we use time series Krieging uh, to look at the area of the, the probable area of occurrence for their distribution. So, so far, we've tagged five males and one female zone-tailed hawk. Uh, the female was kind of a bycatch we were trying for the male, but a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, so we put a transmitter on her. We have uh, summer home ranges for two males in 2001, and uh, that one of those males died on the wintering grounds in 2021. And uh, now we've caught two males this last summer and the one female. And so I have data adequate to show you for six summer home ranges for males, uh, two winter home ranges, three fall migrations, and, I'll, and uh, uh, two spring migrations. And I'll show you a bit more here in just a second. So what you see here on the graphic is the outlines of the home ranges. And the big outline, uh, the larger outline is the 95% kernel. And the small outline inside is the 50% kernel home range. The one down in the bottom where there's a bunch of overlap, that's a bird that we first caught. We have three summer home ranges for him. Here in the table, he's number 375. And you can see he pretty much, his home range is the same every year. For those of you that uh, have trouble with metrics, I've also put this in square miles. And so we have birds with Summer home ranges ranging from 27 to 144 square miles, which is just huge. And that's the 95%, that's not the 100% home range. The uh, weighted average is 67 square miles, which is very large for a diurnal bird of prey. This graphic is the migration route. 
uh, for uh, bird 375. And that's uh, both the autumn and the spring migration routes. And you can see he kind of follows that same route every year down to El Salvador. Uh, the bird that died got down to Guatemala uh, is where he died. We think he was either electrocuted or shot off a telephone pole. Uh, fall migration takes 10 to 18 days. Spring migration takes 10 to 11. I have some data to update the fall migrations, uh, but haven't done that yet. Uh, the actual route for these birds is about 2,600 kilometers. And the winter home ranges for the one bird, we have multiple winter home ranges. He goes back to the same area and occupies the same winter home range, as you can see in this bottom graphic. That's 375, and he's back in the same area this year. Winter home ranges are even larger than the summer home ranges, as you can see in this, uh, this table. These are in square kilometers. Okay. So this is the data upload from uh, just the other day. And this shows the current active live birds. This purple line is bird 375 that went to El Salvador. He's back on the same home range as he's been the last two years. Follows the exact same route. Uh, this green bird uh, from over near Chinati, he went down and he stopped uh, near a big reservoir and he's island hopping at this reservoir. He's been there for about a month now. And that seems to be where he's gonna be spending his winter in Chiapas, Mexico. This orangish red line is, a, uh, her nest had failed about two weeks after we banded her. And she moved down to this small town in Mexico. That's why this is where the point starts from. She spent a couple months there before she started migration. And now she's over around along a uh, laguna out in the, uh, the Yucatan. Uh, and she's been hanging out there for about a month. And then the really cool one is this bluebird. He took the longest to start migration. He followed pretty much the same route as 375, but he is currently all the way down in Panama. And uh, we're taking bets on whether or not he crosses the Panama Canal or makes it all the way to Ecuador. Uh, we have no idea. These, what you're looking at right now, are the first quantitative data ever collected for migration of zone tailed hawks. And so, uh, I can say without any hesitation, what I'm providing you are the largest home ranges and migration routes for zone-tailed hawks ever reported. It's also the smallest home ranges and migration distances for zone-tailed hawks ever reported. So it's kind of a unique position to be in. Uh, uh, it's and it's it looks. It's, it's going to be fun to see what happens with these birds going forward. <clears throat> so to, to wrap this up, mean breeding season home ranges was about 64 square miles, which again is really, really large for a raptor of this size. Uh, mean nearest neighbor distance for zone-tailed hawks was 1.8 kilometers within these riparian areas, but we had them nesting as close as 636 meters. And so the way I interpret this is that Kind of think about it like seabirds nesting on uh, a rocky island. Uh, you're out in the middle of the ocean. There's nowhere to nest except that island. And so you put up with each other being very close, but then you have the whole ocean to forage over. And I think that's the way these zone tailed hawks, at least in the Trans Pecos, are looking at it is you have these little islands of cottonwood groves, of cottonwood groves that you can all nest in, but then you forage out over the vast Chihuahuan desert for your prey. And so that's kind of the analogy I have for that. Uh, yeah, I already kind of uh, mentioned all of this. We anticipate, uh, again, two more hawks to add to this project with GPS units. And I also have some GSM units to try to put out. So I could put, I, I may be able to put out as many as five transmitters this coming summer if I get access to uh, the locations and have luck catching these hawks. These are, these, the, catching these birds takes a lot of work. And so for acknowledgements, I'd like to, to make sure I acknowledge uh, the Dixon Water Foundation, Alameda Ranch, Big Bend Ranch State Park, Davis Mountain State Park, uh, Mary Baxter, uh, and the Shield Ranch. 
I'm sure I'm missing somebody here, but these these entities have all been really welcoming to us for this project. Uh, Derek Malone uh, for field assistance, Lawrence Vargas, Romy Swanson, uh, uh, Corey Rilke, I, I believe, for uh, some of the photos. And then uh, uh, my partners in this project, Brent Bibles, who you see here holding the bird, uh, Krista Demery from Texas Parks and Wildlife, you see holding the camera, and then Ben Skipper uh, from Angelo State. Uh, Brent is from uh, Unity College. Uh, Brent is, uh, Ben is from Angelo State. Uh, they've all been partners in this endeavor. And I really want to do a shout out for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department from Fort Davis and Alpine. Uh, they have been just great. The personnel there have been great to work with for this. And so with that, uh, I will end the presentation and I'm happy to try to answer any questions people may have in the chat.